Hello again. This is lecture two of two for chapter number two, planning a healthy diet. And I'm going to go back one slide in comparison to where I was on the previous lecture, uh, just in case you are um, you took a break <laughs> in between watching one and two. And again, we are talking about diet planning guides, and um, in particular the ones produced by the USDA. And um, they're going to give recommended amounts, recommended amounts of things like calories and vitamins and minerals. And you've got some good information on or in table 2-3 as it relates to kilocalories. And uh, over time, in particular as you're taking this class, you, you will be able to make a determination as to where you fall uh, on this table as it relates to how many calories you're burning in a given day. And once you understand how uh, how many calories you're burning and how many calories uh, an average person is burning and how many calories a patient might be burning based upon uh, their condition, uh, their medications, uh, the amount of physical activity that they get, then you can make better, much better recommendations about what they should be eating. These next few slides, very general. Uh, there's quite a few pages in chapter number two uh, showing you the food groups. Um, I, I, I have a lot of faith in you all already that you already know those food groups and the types of foods that will fall under each category. But if you don't, then I would ask that you refer to uh, the section of the text that shows you um, what types of foods fall under each category. But as I said, those are those are pretty straightforward. Now let's talk about the the USDA food guide. And I, I will forewarn you that the USDA food guide, or what used to be called um, my pyramid, it's constantly changing. And um, let's let's go let's go there for a second let's go out to my pyramid and interestingly um, I went out there earlier today just to to look at uh, the, the latest version or iteration of the food guide pyramid and uh, I noticed that <laughs> they don't even show a pyramid anymore now the food guide pyramid is showing a plate and I have to admit this makes a lot more sense to me than does the food guide pyramid because the the current food guide pyramid is a little bit hard to decipher even for someone like me who has a lot of experience um, with nutrition but what I'm looking at here and what you see on your screen the, the choose my plate gov that makes a lot of sense because it, it shows proportionally on a plate how much of your plate should be vegetables and how much should be protein and how much should be grains and how much should be fruit and how much should be dairy and um, in, in rather simplistic terms that's something that people can can wrap their their brain around and apply to their everyday life now you'll notice as you look at the plate in front of you that the single largest section there is the vegetables <laughs> uh, and the vegetables and the grains I would say that makes up about somewhere in the neighborhood of two-thirds of the plate now that when you look at the average American diet that is not the case um, we, we see that protein portion being a much larger proportion um, the the highly processed carbohydrates um, and the, technically that would fall under the grain section but if we could um, if we could look at that more specifically uh, it, we would know that the, the average American diet has a lot more simple sugars in it as opposed as opposed to complex carbohydrates so um uh, anyway, I, I, I like that, and there's a lot of resources out there um, at, um, at mypyramid.gov, which interestingly takes you directly to choosemyplate.gov now, um, but there's a lot of resources out there that you can use in this class and ultimately use in a clinical setting. Let's talk about food labels, and uh, I believe if you look at figure 2-8 in your text, you will see a food label, and I'm gonna. I'm just gonna go ahead and skip over those two slides. You can go back and look at them if you'd like. And actually, I guess I probably should skip more slowly so that if you want to pause this, you can read it. But um, I'm gonna talk rather specifically here uh, about what you can find in Figure 2-8, and 
this is a standardized format that the USDA has put forth and food manufacturers in America or for that matter anywhere in the world that ship food into America to be sold here they have to have this nutrition facts section in this format on that food and uh, at the top you're gonna see serving size and by the way that's one area where food manufacturers can fudge just a little bit um, what you and I might think of as a standard serving size might not actually be the standard serving size for example a um, a soda, a bottle of soda. In my opinion, that's a serving size. Uh, most people, if they're going to sit down to lunch and they are going to drink a, uh, a 20 ounce soda, they think of that as one serving. However, if you look on the bottle, it's two and a half servings. So what that's saying is you're going to you're going to drink that soda at two and one half meals. Well, that, well, you and I know that's not reality. So sometimes the food manufacturer can they can fudge just a little bit and they can make the serving size smaller than what it really is um, but luckily the FDA requires that the nutrition facts section show the servings per container so you can do a little bit of math there and see for yourself really how large a serving size is then you're going to get some information about fat, in particular information about saturated fat and trans fats. And the reason that those two are highlighted is because those are the two that are really dangerous. Saturated fat, that's the type of fat that dramatically contributes to cardiovascular disease. Um, primarily because your liver will take that saturated fat, turn it into low density lipoproteins. Those are the guys that are really sticky, have an, uh, have an affinity to the arterial walls. And before you know it, you get a plaque formation. And once you end up with a plaque formation somewhere in the arteries, it will never go away. And all it does is grow over time. So we want to prevent those from forming. And um, and a good way to do that is to look at the nutrition facts section and make sure that you're using that you're making healthy choices and that you're not eating too much saturated fat now trans fats those are the really dangerous guys and um, that's a that's where fat's gone through a, a hydrogenation process and uh, it, it makes a really nasty dangerous fat you'll also see information about how much cholesterol is in there and, and of course cholesterol can also contribute to cardiovascular disease uh, how much sodium is, is in the product and of course too much sodium can lead to high blood pressure then we're going to get information about the the carbohydrates in particular the dietary fiber and the sugars dietary fiber that's indigestible carbohydrates and we need a certain amount of that we need a certain amount of food a, a certain amount of a fiber uh, that, that's going into our gastrointestinal system that cannot be digested. Now you may think that seems counterintuitive to be ingesting something that cannot be digested. However, it's very important because that indigestible food keeps the food soft as it moves through the gastrointestinal system. In particular, that's important as the food moves through the colon, moves through the large intestine. Uh, if the food gets really hard, that can cause uh, it can literally cause damage to the colon and um, when you have damage to the large intestine slash colon that can result in a condition called diverticulosis and um, diverticulosis can result in diverticulitis which just means an inflammation of the diverticulum and um, th th that can that can be a pretty nasty condition that a person can suffer suffer with for a lifetime after it's formed sugars we want to keep those low to make sure that uh, we're not putting ourselves at risk for diabetes type 2 and then uh, next you'll see uh, the, the number of grams of protein and then there's some information down here about the amount of um, the amount of saturated fat, cholesterol, sodium, total carbohydrates, fiber that you should be ingesting based upon how many calories you're ingesting in a given day. And we talked a little bit about that a few minutes ago. And over time, you will gain very good perspective as to how many calories you, as well as a patient, may be burning in a given day based upon activity level. take a look here and see how much time we have left <clears throat> um, 
something else that the FDA regulates is food claims and on food labels there can be no implied claims. Uh, they have to be very specific. Um, they can put some general terms uh, such as um, free or good source of, you know, free being, you know, they can say uh, something's fat free, they can put that, or go good source of, for example, good source of calcium. They can do things like that. They just can't make any specific claims as it relates to uh, a food ingredient and a disease. Um, I'll just read this one. Fat and cholesterol terms include percentage, fat free, fat free, low fat, less fat, saturated fat, saturated fat free, low saturated fat, less saturated fat, trans fat free, and cholesterol. Cholesterol free, low cholesterol, low cholesterol, less cholesterol, extra lean, and lean. <laughs> and all of those are legitimate claims based upon the stipulations that the FDA has set up for those individual claims. And you can go to the FDA's website and see exactly what those are. Uh, if you want some additional information about health claims and the FDA, you can navigate your way out to that website. And um, there's an article here about claims that can be made for conventional foods and dietary supplements. And they have these lists as well that um, some relationships between there, there are relationships between food and risk for disease and they categorize those into an A, B, C, and D list and um, I've seen the FDA kind of get away from that over the last few years but um, nonetheless they exist. I've already touched on that. Your text does talk about this Healthier U.S. initiative. Uh, that is a program that has gone by the wayside. That will certainly not be in the next edition. Um, that was a Bush administration initiative. Now, of course, um, you know, we, we have changed administrations, and um, the Obama administration, their, their focus is a little bit different. And uh, Of course, Michelle Obama is, is leading that charge. So uh, you know, each individual each individual administration has their own little pet projects and um, unfortunately or fortunately depending upon how you look at it uh, the healthier US initiative no longer exists let's talk very quickly talk about the health benefits of a vegetarian diet there are very distinct benefits in particular we see a very low level of cardiovascular disease in people who are vegetarians and if you're not eating cholesterol and high levels of saturated fat you're not going to have cardiovascular disease. It's really as straightforward as that. There's some information about the My Vegetarian Food Pyramid and in actuality that is it, it is very simplistic. People who are vegetarians they're not ingesting 100 percent of the recommended daily allowance for and I, maybe I shouldn't put it that way. They're not in, ingesting an adequate amount of Amino, of essential amino acids. Um, we have essential and non-essential and the non-essential amino acids our bodies can make. They can make those fundamental building blocks. The essential amino acids we have to have those in our diet and the, the average person is going to get those through eating meat. Um, so a, a, a vegetarian has to be very specific about the foods that he or she eats to make sure that he or she is getting those individual essential amino acids into his or her diet. Same can be true for, for calcium. There are vegetarians out there that do not eat any animal products, which means of course they're not eating milk or milk products. Uh, those diets can be very low in vitamin D. Uh, those can also be low in vitamin B12. We need vitamin B12 for, um, for our nervous system to function. That is chapter number two in a in a nutshell, and um, th those last bullet points are are kind of um, uh, th that's getting to the essence of what chapter number two is about. A variety of food is the key to adequacy, and um, so long as you're eating a variety of fruits and vegetables, and you're moderating your meats and moderating your saturated fats. Uh, and you're probably doing fairly well. Now, of course, um, there's some, there's a lot of other aspects there to being healthy as well. You need to um, 
need to be exercising on a regular basis, but if you're exercising on a regular basis, you're eating a variety of foods, uh, that's a pretty good step toward being healthy. Thank you for your attention.